we are now going to examine the wonderful holiday known as Christmas. Now what could be possibly wrong with having the spirit of goodwill towards men and all this? Well, if you understand the truth behind the Christmas story, you're going to find out that the whole thing is wrong. When I was a child, I remember when my father used to take us out to the woods and we would take an axe, we would find a nice full pine tree and we would cut it down, we would drag it through the snow, we would bring it in the house, much to my mother's protest because there'd be pine needles and snow everywhere. And then we would set it up on one of those metal stands so that it wouldn't move, you know, we made sure it was really good and solid, and we would um, deck it with gold and silver trimmings and everything. And of course, you know, put the traditional five-pointed sow on top of it. And this is what most people, if they're from my generation, and most people nowadays, um, would have gone through that. I'm not saying that you will go out and cut down a tree. No, most, a lot of people like going for the artificial stuff. So what could possibly be wrong with a Christmas tree? Is there anything unbiblical or ungodly about it? Well, According to the Bible, in Jeremiah chapter 10, we pick it up in verse 1. It says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, and folks, I want you to memorize these next seven words. Learn not the way of the heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. Now listen very carefully to this one in the middle of verse 3. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, they deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a Christmas tree. And right here, in God's own word, he says, learn not the way of the heathen. When the heathen are the ancient occultists, they're also known as pagans. You are not supposed to be practicing any of this. God's own word makes it very clear not to be involved in this. And yet, there are going to be those people who's going to try to convince you, well, God's not talking about a tree here. He was referring to a plant or to something else. I've heard these arguments over and over and over again, ladies and gentlemen, and quite honestly, at this age, I'm sick of it. Because God's word makes it very clear. These people have gone out, they've cut down a tree, they brought it home, they fastened it so it didn't move, they put all types of gold and silver decorations on it, they decked the halls with it, and this is exactly what we're doing to this very day. So don't tell me that this is something other than a tree, because this is exactly what those pagans were doing then, and that's exactly what we're doing now. And when we take a look just at one of these pictures, this is exactly what the Bible had been talking about. People had been trimming it and decking it with gold and silver and all these wonderful, beautiful items that I wanted. The um, pagans, among other things, they would um, put little um, pieces of cake, candy, and sweet items on it. This is why to this very day we're putting um, candy canes and other things like that on it because it's part of the ancient pagan practice of honoring the winter stag god. Now, as I just stated, Jeremiah makes it very, very clear that Christmas trees are not supposed to be observed. They have absolutely nothing to do with anything that is good or godly. So then the question is, why are we doing it? On top of the Christmas tree, and just about most Christmas trees, you will find that there is a five-pointed star. Now the question is, why do we have, you know, such an item on top of our trees? If you recall, well, there's many different candies, little cakes and offerings and such here. All this is here because it goes all the way back to Nimrod. Nimrod himself, 
as depicted here, this is one of the ancient depictations on a relief of Nimrod. Nimrod himself, if you remember, was the stag god. He was considered the winter god. And just like at um, Rockefeller Center, where they have these huge Christmas trees every year all lit up, at the top you'll find the traditional five-pointed star. Now, interesting enough, at the base, in front of Rockefeller Center, whose address is 666, mind you, and it's no accident because if you've ever gone to that building, and I've seen it and been there before, the very top, these huge neon lights, there are three red sixes that will glow at night. But at the base of this um, tree, is a statue, and that remains there all year. And let me show you a larger version of this. That statue is um, the statue of Prometheus. Now, Prometheus, if you know your ancient um, Greek legends, was the one who stole the fire of illumination from the gods and brought it down to mankind. So mankind now had um, illumination or, or the enlightenment of wisdom. He stole the fire from the gods. So, why are there, among other things, Christmas lights on the tree? Well, you see, there's a lot of history behind this. You see, in the old days, um, people from the old world, like me and others, um, and from the ancient days, and the people who are practicing the occult to this very day, candles would be put on top of the trees, among other things, because it was the dark times. You know, this was a season of the year in which the, um, most of the sun was gone and it was constantly dark out. Well, candles were lit that was actually used as a beacon to the winter god so that during the evenings he would see those lights fly over and come around your house and bless the people inside of the house in your home for walking him back in. This is why the candles were used, and to this very day, we're still using these seasonal lights. We're, you know, we've got electric lights, so we've modernized the practice of welcoming back the stag god. We put them around the tree, we'll put them in the windows, and we have these massive displays outside, in which these lights, according to the ancient occult practice now, is supposed to welcome back onto the earth the winter god. Now, part of the practice of Christmas is hanging, it, well, I should say, first of all, is the Yule log fire. Now, this, you know, the log inside of it is referred to as the Yule log. Now, it's not called Yule for no reason at all. Remember, this is December 21st, the human night sacrifice of Yule. Now, tradition teaches us in the occult no longer me, because I'm a born again Christian, God be praised. But tradition in the occult teaches that, um, first of all, the Yule log should be made out of birch. Once um, it has been lit and used for um, the holidays, you're supposed to keep one part of the birch log or the Yule log and set it aside for next year. Why you do this is because you're supposed to take that piece of the Yule log from last year and like this year's Yule log. This way, it's a constant cycle. You take from the old, give to the new, the new keeps rekindling um, itself over and over again. This, symbolically speaking, is the cycle of reincarnation because every year you welcome back into your home by lighting the Yule log the god of the winter known as the stag god or originally known as Nimrod. Now, what could possibly be so ungodly about kissing underneath the mistletoe? Well, there's a couple things wrong with this, first of all. One thing I will warn you about, people, whatever you do, never touch those berries. Three of them could kill you. This plant is so poisonous. Um, among other things that's wrong with it, Mistletoe itself was very sacred to the Druids. Um, it was a fertility plant. This was a very sacred plant 
to the Druids, from which the Illuminati claim direct ascendancy from. They claim to be the modern day Druids, or the modern day rendition of the Druids. And it's because this is a fertility plant that people kiss underneath it. Now, with the mistletoe, we have another fertility plant known as the wreath. You know, we make a Christmas wreath. It's green and red, and you will find, constantly find green and red throughout the Christmas season because in the occult world, those are the two colors that I use for this season. And for every season, they do have specific colors that's used for their occult magic and occult belief system. Now, the wreath itself is always circular if they're an occult practitioner, and there will always be candles in the center of it. The reason this is so, as I said before, this is another fertility symbol. The candle or candles represent the male phallic symbol. The circle represents the female reprodu reproductive organs. This is why it is a um, symbolically speaking, a fertility symbol. And this is something, symbolically speaking, we have a circle here, man of the beats, that represents reincarnation. In other words, the life, the birth, and the death of the stag god <clears throat> every single year. And you will find that this symbol originated from the great obelisk in Egypt. Now here is a picture of the Vatican City. You'll notice dead center is the obelisk. This obelisk here, at the very top of it, in that bowl supposedly resides the um, charred remains, um, the cremated ashes of Julius Caesar. But notice dead center is the, Christ well, to the side is the Christmas tree. Now, the obelisk itself, and let me explain this to you. Notice how the obelisk is here and there's a circle around it. This is a very ancient occult pagan symbol of fertility. Now, you will notice that there are sets of lines, two here, two here, and all the way around. Now, the reason the obelisk was designed in such a fashion was because it's really, in actuality, a giant heliocentric sundial. The shadow of this obelisk, and all obelisks were of the art throughout the world, is going to fall in a certain place depending on the position of the sun. Now, if the obelisk shadow falls within any of these two lines, it is another night of human sacrifice. That's why there is eight sets of them, because the shadow will fall in between these sets throughout the year. And of course, as I said before, notice, you know, the um, Vatican Church is going to make sure they have their pagan Christmas tree right here in, um, in St. Peter's um, Square. And other examples of the obelisk we have here is one in um, Central Park in, um, in New York. This would be Cleopatra's Needle. Supposedly, this is one of the three um, needles that resided in Heliopolis when um, they were um, just dragged from Egypt and brought here to America. This one here. Well, we've already gone over this one in the first DVD. This particular one was man-made, just like the others, but this one was made here in Washington, D.C. This is, of course, the Washington Monument, 555 feet above ground, 111 feet below ground, making for the total height of this occult pagan symbol, 666 feet exactly. And if you notice, like the other ones, here we have the male um, phallic symbol and there is a circle all the way around it, which represents the female reproductive organs. This is nothing but the ancient occult fertility symbol of Semiramis and Nimrod just brought to the modern day through the, orga through the organization of the Illuminati. Now, of course, we have 
another fertility, another fertility symbol here. This one is the holly. These are holly berries. And again, this is um, another sacred plant in the Illuminati. They still worship this as one of the more sacred plants. It's another fertility symbol. As I said before, these are the holly berries. And of course, there is, from the old country, the person known as the holly king. Okay? It's from the holly king, the whole stories behind the holly king and such, where eventually another person comes into play. From the holly king, you get who's known as Santa Claus. Now, Santa Claus is an interesting study because, you know, through Santa Claus, the Illuminati has tried to prove that they are like gods on the earth, through the myth. Now, when we go through the story of Santa Claus, Santa Claus is actually supposed to be all-knowing. I mean, think about this. Doesn't Santa Claus know who's been good and who's been nice every single day of the year? That's one of Santa Claus's ability. He, he knows exactly who's been good and who's been nice, and he knows um, how this has worked for each, of an, each individual throughout the year. Well, Santa Claus has the ability of being omnipresent, or just about, because on the night of Christmas, is he not able to traverse the entire world and literally just about be everywhere at the same time and drop off who knows how many billions of presents? Well, at least that's what the story tells us. And Santa Claus, his sleigh, if you notice, is pulled by eight reindeers. Now these are um, commonly known as stags. This is why, if you notice very quickly people, Santa Claus is just another representation of the stag god. And it's for eight reindeers, eight for no reason at all. You see, eight is the only number that if you put it on its side, becomes an occult symbol, which is the number for infinity. Or, the act of reincarnation throughout the year, in this case, Santa Claus. Now, here we have one of the ancient depictations of the stag god. It's one of the few um, bronze reliefs that we still have. You notice he has the horns as a stag, and um, he has this bracelet here, and other things that denote him as the stag god. Santa's little helpers, and this is what really kills me, you know, rather than own up to the truth, what we've done here in America, well, we've given them a cute little look, you know, well, these are just little helpers dressed in green and red, and they help Santa throughout the year, you know, making toys and what me not. But you see, the traditions of most of, of America, of most of the holidays, come from Europe. And the true um, elves uh, um, of Christmas were very horrible, evil little creatures. They went around and caused mischief for everyone or anyone who came across them. And the problem is, um, these elves have now, um, ever since the 40s and up to this day because of J.R.R. Tolkien, have now, called, have now become tall, slender, beautiful looking beings with great power and all this, they've been transformed um, as a result of that. But the truth of the matter is, the ancient um, traditions and pictures do not lie. They point out to us that the traditional elves were nothing but small, demonic, imp-like creatures who caused anyone trouble who came across their paths. And there's a, a very interesting elf um, that you'll find in Scotland. It's, um, it's, it's around Argyll. This is a giant wooden elf. And if you notice, it is anything but a 
cutesy little, warm, fuzzy little creature. This is a horrible, evil-looking creature. And that's what they were all about. Elves, you know, only became, you know, cutesy once we decided to try to dress up the occult practice of Yule and call it Christmas and make it something palatable. And as I stated before, well, of course, over the Christmas fire, you know, the Yule time, the Yule log fire, well, we hand Christmas stockings. Stockings have, you know, according to the ancient um, practices, is where presents were left, not for the person to get, but they were supposed to leave presents there for the Yule God, for the stag God to take. But we reversed it, and supposedly now, those are there for our benefits. People put small gifts and items in them, um, and if Santa Claus determines you're bad, you get, you know, charcoal put in them instead, you know? Now, all this is where, from the occult world, the modern day practice of Christmas has come from. But the question that we need to ask is, is this the birthday of Christ? Was Christ born on December 25th? And if not, whose birthday is it? Now, when we turn to the book of Luke, we're going to get a major clue as to what, um, as to whether or not Christ was born on the 25th um, of December, let alone during the season. According to Luke chapter 2, in, it goes from verse 1 to verse 5, it says, and it came to pass in those days that w there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made from Cyrenius, was governor, was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Okay? So, we have a biblical marker right there. There was, historically speaking, and we can prove this, um, a, um, a taxation from Caesar Augustus. Now, according to the ancient records, this um, taxation happened during the month of September. Now, let's just keep that in mind as we go along. Um, picking it up, chapter 2, verse 8, it says, and this is very important, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, there are shepherds out in the field right now, and they're watching over the flock. I have spoken to many Jewish friends of mine and to rabbis I've known about this passage. My friends who have lived on kibbutzes have told me that the sheep that shepherds watch over in the, over in the fields around that part of Judea and such, um, the sheep are never brought out of the field until the end of September or, and they say, usually no later than the second week of October because it gets too cold out there for the sheep to, um, to survive in. So it's around that time of the year that they will bring the, she the sheep in. And the rabbis have told me the sim a similar story. They all say right around that same time. So, two things we can conclude so far, safely as far as I can see it. The, the timing of the taxation, and according to people who live there in Judea to this very day and in the past, who have spoken to me and who have been eyewitnesses, says that's the time of the year when they bring the sheep in. It's not after October or, you know, the middle, it's not after that, it's before it and usually that is somewhere around the end of September or around the beginning to the mid part of October. So we know that that's when the timing of the shepherds had to have been, right around that time. Now, we find out another interesting thing in the Bible. We have to pick this up, going back to Matthew, Chapter 2, and we started in verse 1.
And this is going to be a bit of a length, lengthy one, but just bear with me. This has a lot of important information for us. Now when, Jesus, now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people, Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may also come and worship him. When they had heard uh, the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. We'll just stop it there. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary. Guess what? They did not find him in the manger. You know, according to ridiculous traditional beliefs, Christ was um, visited by everyone in the manger. Now this, um, a friend of mine took this photo for me, Lynn Shalesky. This is quite a manger scene. You know, we have um, three wise men. Now according to Catholic teaching, that's Gaspar, Belthazar, and Melchior. Um, we have an angel there, uh, we have a shepherd there, camels, we have a donkey, and a couple of sheep. And most of those people weren't there. You see, the Bible tells us that when Christ was born, Mary and Joseph was put out in the manger because there was no room for them in the stalls. And according to what we just read right now, it says about the wise men. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. You see, they never made it to the manger. They never did. You see, this is two years later after Christ was born. Go into the Bible. It makes it very, very clear that, first of all, these wise men, when Christ was being born, they saw the great star of the east. They weren't there in Judea when they saw it. These people are from the Far East. They had to literally cross from one end of the continent all the way across and then down into the land of Judea to where they could finally make it. And this took approximately two years, ladies and gentlemen, because they didn't have automobiles or planes or trains. They took camels. And they formed a giant caravan and this caravan literally had to have been humongous because you see in that in those days and age um, um, Judea and the outer provinces was not the place to visit because um, they had a lot of sordid people there it was just not a user-friendly place to put it politely so the wise men and it was more than three because they had to pull their resources together first of all and get permission from whatever um, potentate they, um, um, they were under authority and they had to leave and make that two year crossing with a huge army by their side so that they would be protected. Now, they would go to the region. They had, remember, golds of gi of, um, gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh and when they got to Christ, it was two years later and then they presented him with the gifts. 
and it is two years because if you recall in further on in the Bible it said that Herod was so upset that um, he could not find out from the wise men where the baby Jesus was because he didn't want to worship him he wanted to murder him so once the wise men had told him um, what had happened he knew that Christ was two years old at this at this point which is why he told his soldiers to go out into Jerusalem and kill all the two-year-old um, male children from two and under they were all supposed to be butchered that's why it was two years old because of the timing this is what was going on Christ was two years old at the at this time the wise men had informed Herod how long it took them to get from one end of the continent to where they were now and so all he had to do from that point was just tell the soldiers kill all the male children two and under so the question then becomes if it wasn't the Lord's birthday whose birthday was it if you recall back in our first DVD of this series we found out that Semiramis and Nimrod had a child known as Tammuz and Tammuz was supposed to be the reincarnation of Nimrod because he had been killed now Tammuz's birthday in according to the ancient um, records and everything Tammuz was born on December 25th now according to occult practice remember Yule is the night of, the tw of December 21st. It's the longest um, winter night um, for the year. And it is on um, this day that a night of human sacrifice occurs. What had happened? In order to marry this new movement of Catholicism into um, paganism, they took December 21st, moved it up to December 25th, the birthday of Tammuz. There was also a major Roman festival at that time on December 25th known as Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a big festival in which, you know, there would be these huge parades of people um, going through the cities and to the heart of Rome. They would be dressed in their finest outfits and they would be bringing offerings and gifts and everything. And there'd be, you know, a lot of wine drinking. Um, there'd be ham and birds being served as um, parts of the banquet. And gifts were actually being given to all the people. And there was a lot of wine and merriment. Well, you know what? The same thing goes on to this very day. Aren't we given, you know, these Christmas gift offerings and aren't we, you know, still having the Christmas ham and aren't we giving gifts to one another and don't we still have, you know, these long Christmas parades, you know, I think they're called, um, they're, they're in New York and other places, we have these huge parades. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, Saturnalia is still being practiced to this very day on December 25th, except all we've done is candy coated we've christianized it and we've called it christmas you know when we take a look at this ancient relief this is whose birthday we're celebrating this is one of the most ancient and one of the few reliefs we have of the god known as tammuz and it really saddens me to think that somehow we've allowed this pagan god to be um, deified and allowed to be um, the god of Christmas. We, instead of um, having absolutely nothing to do with this pagan occult festival, we're actually worshiping the ancient god known as Temuz. I think by now and I don't think I have to go any further into this. I think it's quite obvious from just from the biblical perspective alone that God wants us to have absolutely nothing to do with these occult practices because they are occult practices. They're nothing that we should be involved in. God said, learn not the way of the heathen. 
And over in Corinthians, he strictly tells us not to go after the traditions of men. Because that's all these are. We find out from the scriptures, um, only Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds, and some animals, made it to the manger. The angels, believe it or not, had already made their proclamation to the shepherds that Christ was born, and then they left. They didn't make it to the manger. Um, the wise men never made it to the manger. It took them two years to finally get to um, where the Lord was. And even the Bible says that they finally found Joseph in his mother's house. We should have absolutely nothing to do with any of these occult holidays. And, yeah, it might appear as if I'm being a stick in the mud here. Because, let's face it, these holidays are alluring. I mean, come on, we get presents, you know? And, you know, we sometimes get to choose what presents we want, even though we're not supposed to, you know, but... So it's very alluring because, as I've told people time and time again, there is a beautiful side to evil, and it's a very, very seductive one. It will twist and distort your reasoning and deceive you into believing that these things are indeed Christians, but they are not. Scripture warns us that um, the deceit of the enemy is so strong, it could even deceive us, the elected children of God. So I'm going to leave it up to you, ladies and gentlemen, because let's face it, you are responsible for this knowledge now. It's between you and God, but I would tell you right now, I would get rid of this occult practice as soon as I could, because the longer you allow it to stay in your life, the harder it is for you to get rid of it. And all I can say is right now, um, just think about all the evidence, review it in the Bible, and judge for yourself. Let's talk about how it began. Witchcraft in the church. Unmasking paganism is to un uncover the veil and expose the pagan practices that are happening in the church. This is an end time message, I believe, for the church. And this is also a crash course on paganism and its dangers. You see, we don't want to be deceived by the enemy's devices. It's because some things can look good, sound good, but not necessarily mean they're good. I'm also a son of a preacher. In the 1980s, my father had a ministry called Miracle Temple in Dallas, Texas. I witnessed many deliverances and healings. And as a preacher's kid, I was the one that carried this big old, you know, family Bible that would run around and tell everybody, hey, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell, you know, the big old Bibles and everything. But everything was going fine until witchcraft entered into the pews. I believe a family of witches, we called Jezebels, were sent to destroy the ministry. Great division began occurring when they began to come. They, I believe they cast a spell on my father. They planted a pouch in the church, and they planted a pouch inside our home. It was involved with a grandmother, a, a mother, and a daughter. And understand, they were the biggest financial supporters of the ministry. They became close to the leaders. You understand that they're going to get real close to the leaders. The congregation members wanted them out, but my father would not listen to them. Well, mainly because of they were bringing the finances into the church. But the ministry was destroyed. The Jezebel spirit destroyed the work of the Lord. The Miracle Temple no longer exists today. Actually, it's been torn to the ground. I went just recently to go see about where it's at. It's not there no more. 1815 Canada Drive in Dallas, Texas is not there no more. See, by allowing Jezebel into the church, it brings devastation. It will destroy a church. Let's look at Psalm 74, 3. Lift up thy feet into the perpetual desolations, even to all that the enemy have done wickedly in the sanctuary. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up signs for, in signs for signs. Psalm 74, 7. They have cast fire into thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. Does it sound like witchcraft came into that sanctuary? It sure did. Revelation 2.20, Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel would cause herself a prophetess to, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And it said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. This is Jezebel in the church. The, what does the Jezebel spirit does? It seduces. It gains authority in the church. It also brings in flatteries. It rebels against male authority. It uses beauty and seduction and will lure you to ruin. And also, it's not necessarily a woman. It could also be a man. 
Let's look at the sum of the spirits. It gains power by destroying others. It uses sex to control their man. Never wrong. Let's look at this one. They're warlike in their personality or deceptively sweet. In other words, they can be mean at the same time they can be sweet. They seduce the shepherds or those in leadership and they bring in paganism. You got to understand that Elijah stood up for righteousness. That's what we need some people to stand up for righteousness today. The children of Israel rebelled and they began worshiping Baal. The prophet Elijah stood up for truth. See, the church has rebelled. We need to stand up today and get paganism out of the church. Revelation 2.22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. This we call spiritual idolatry. In other words, we're committing fornication with all these different paganism that's coming to the church. See, we've got to understand that paganism cannot stay in the church. These are the last days. It's not necessarily rituals and practices, but seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Let's talk about the uh, witchcraft, witchcraft unnoticed in the church. This is my second encounter on Sunday, July 8, 2001. I was invited to one of the largest mega churches in Dallas, Texas. I was invited to speak to the children about the dangers of magic and the occult. I, during my PowerPoint presentation, the Holy Spirit convicted the children. An example, at the altar, they began bringing their Harry Potter books and their card games, their Pokemon, and their Neopets. And they began bringing them to the altar or probably picked up hundreds of dollars worth of material. They said, we want nothing to do. If this has to do with the devil, we want nothing to do with it. But the church did not receive the warning message. I got a phone call and got complaints from the children's parents. They saw nothing wrong with books like Harry Potter, and I was bringing scare tactics. They said those toys were not cheap, and it keeps them entertained. And this, this gave me another encounter that the church doesn't realize that paganism is in the church. This was my second encounter, and I found my answers. Understand, spiritual blindness is in the church. There's blind guides leading the blind. What does the Bible say? Matthew 15, 14, let them alone, be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Luke 6, 39, can the blind lead the blind, shall they not both fall into the ditch? In other words, the blind are leading the blind today. Isaiah 56, 10, it says, his watchmen are blind, they are ignorant, they are dumb dogs, they cannot bark, sleep, and lie down, loving to slumber. He goes on to say, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. In other words, they're in it for the money. There's a lot of shepherds out there that are hirelings. They do it for the money. But God is calling true watchmen to give them warning from me. It says, I set you up as a watchman. And I believe that I'm watchman to the church to realize that paganism is in the church and we have to get it out. See, today the tr truth is blurred. We need truth more than ever before. People will accept anything because they're blinded by Satan's lies. Truth will bring deliverance and set the captives free. What does it say? It also, we're trying to find the straight and narrow road. In other words, we've lost our way. We lost, we're off course. The church is, 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 is lost. And we're trying to get back on the straight and narrow road. John 8, 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's not going to set you free. It will make you free. When we're free, we're free indeed. Matthew 7, 13, enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for the straight and narrow way. Do you understand that the true church will prevail? Matthew 6, 18, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Understand, the truth will prevail. So why is this message so important? Why is it important to stand up for the truth? What is the objective? To warn the church to beware of things that look and sound good, but are dangerous. In other words, they're poisonous. It just takes a little bit of sprinkle of poison to really uh, mess up the lump. Ephesians 5.11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, 
but rather reprove them, expose, re rebuke, reprove. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. That's what there is, a lot of secrecy going on in the church. And the job is for the watchman to come and expose the darkness. Revelation 18.4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and ye receive not of her plagues. In other words, we got to come out of Babylon. Uh, this is a, a, a confused nation. We're confused about what God we worship, what God we believe in. I'm what you call an apologist. I, I'm apologetic ministry. I'm always ready to give an answer to everyone that asks a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. See, understand, as the church, we got to be ready with answers. we got to be ready when someone comes and asks us, why are we a Christian? Are we just a Christian in name? Are we truly living for the Lord? Today, we got to fight the good fight of faith. It says contend for the faith. The word contends mean to, to fight, to, to continue to uh, persevere, to continue to keep fighting the good fight of faith. I believe a lot of people in the church have given up, but this is the time to give up. This is the time to get in the fight. We got a submergent church. This church is not emergent, it's submergent. The church is headed toward disaster, just like the Titanic. Remember, Titanic said, This is a ship that cannot be sunk. But they didn't heed the warning when they began to see the iceberg. And when they hit that iceberg, the ship began to sink. And the ship is beginning to sink, and we don't realize it. So you, we need to heed the warning today. Now let's talk about paganism, Babylon witchcraft and the occult, to get understanding exactly what is paganism. Paganism is like a cancer that makes its way into our lives to block our path to the truth, to destroy our relationship with God. In other words, it's idolatry, everything that stands in the way of our relationship with God. See, the children of Israel thought they could interact among the pagans and the influence of the nations we got without getting drawn in. So let's look at the origins. Let's look at the beginnings. Genesis 11, 7 says, Go to, let us go down there and confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Therefore is a place called Babel. In other words, the word Babel means confusion. They were Babylon because God confounded their language. The Tower of Babel was a, 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 one of the first places of rebellion. It was the first world government. It was a unified effort for global oneness. Do we hear a lot of that going on right now, that we need oneness, global oneness? We were, they were trying to bring peace and unity with God in the picture. In other words, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. They were trying to reach the heavens, not literally, but spiritually, and understand that this happened, the same thing is happening in our day. These are the ancient empires, Babylon, which was also known as the New Age Movement. The Assyrian barbarians also brought in cannibalism and child sacrifice. The Egyptians, to Pharaoh to them was God, and they worshipped the sun, which was raw. Jerusalem, the children of Israel, began to compromise with the heathens, and they brought the Canaanites, which brought sexual perversion and ritual human sacrifice. Now Israel began to serve other gods like Baal and Ashtoreth, and that's why they were taken into captivity. Here's some of the dark arts in Babylon, spellcasting, astrology, goddess worship, shamanism, charms, uh, castration, divination, amulets, uh, magic, and worshiping sacred animals. These were just some of the practices that were going on in Babylon. Babylon religion believed in reincarnation and karma. They believe when we die, we come back in another life to be reborn. In other words, if you don't get it right here, you're going to be reborn in another life. They also believed in the idea of the force, the force be with you. It's a, it's, a, it's a universalism view that all is one. God is in all and all is one. Paganism was the religion of Jezebel, goddess worship. This is what we call neo-paganism, new paganism. This is where we start to see where it's more in tune with the earth and with nature. It's a worship of Baal. How about sacrificing to Baal? They believed Baal was a male, male fertility god. Nature worshipers, they would sacrifice their children to Baal. Remember they said that they would throw them into the fire. 
They would join priests and the temple prostitutes in sexual orgies to the gods for fertility, for prosperity. And they, were th they thought that they were doing the right thing, turning away from God. Judges 7, 5 says, And in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's a ten-letter wo ten word for paganism. In other words, this is paganism, doing what you want to do fit, what you see fit in your own eyes itself. Jeremiah 10, 2 says, Learn not the way of the heathen. Learn not the way of the pagans. And that's what we, in America, we're kind of just going after every wind of doctrine. We're tossed to and fro. Let's look at the cycle of Israel. First, it started off with the time of peace and prosperity. Then it went to a time of rebellion and paganism. Then they were brought into slavery. Then they repented. They cried out to the Lord and repented. And God restored them. You see, the cycle just continues today. This is the church cycle as well. We're going through this cycle. And right now, we're in the time of rebellion. Shabbat Shalom, Hebrews and Boker Tov. This is Big Sister Ecelia and Emma Miamia bringing you the origin of Christmas. When we think about Christmas, we think of toys, right? And gifts and all of those things. And we think about gifts because they were given to Yahushua. They were given to Yahushua because he was a king. And people gave gifts to kings. Saying, where is he that is born king of Yisrael? And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts gold and frankincense and mirth. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 and 11. So we see that gifts were given to Yahushua the Messiah, but it was not for his birthday. It was because he was a king. But people celebrate Christmas because they think they are celebrating the time when these gifts were given to the Messiah. We also see food and family along with gifts and presents during Christmas. But did you know all of these things are pagan? When people are pagan, it means that they worship the S-U-N sun. So they are sun worshippers, Hebrews. Let's see what Yah says about worshiping the S-U-N sun. Thus says Yah, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of the heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cut a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with an axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also in it is it in them to do good. So what God means here, little Hebrews, is this. The solar system, you heard of the solar system, right? In science, where the solar system is a part of the heavens, because there are many parts of the heavens. And sometimes it changes. But Yah says, do not be surprised about the signs of the heavens. Don't be surprised if they change because Yah did it. But the pagan or S-U-N sun worshippers, they were surprised, Hebrews. They were surprised that the sun did something different and they worshipped it. Then they threw a party to celebrate. Called it the Saturnalia. Let's see what Yah says about worshipping anything but him. I am Yah, your mighty one, who brought you out the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You have no other mighty one against my faith. See, Yah says not to have mighty ones before him, and that includes the S-U-N sun. But what happens to the sun around this time of the year that surprised the pagans? Why were they surprised? 
well in the northern part of the world we have something called the winter solstice which is the day of the year near december 22nd when the sun is furthest from the earth it is the shortest day and the longest night of the year this is why it's colder outside right now little hebrews because we are in the winter solstice around june 21st we have the summer solstice when the sun is closer to the earth and the days are longer and the nights shorter so that's why it's hot around that time so the sun right now is not so close to the earth as in the summertime when it's hot this is what they were celebrating sounds kind of weird right the word solstice comes from s-o-l sol which means sun and stitum which means stoppage so solstice means sun stoppage or standing still sun so they worship the sun because it stood still would you go out and worship the sun if it didn't move isn't that kind of weird for one cutteth a tree out of the forest the work of the hands of a workman with an axe they deck it with silver and with gold they fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not jeremiah chapter 10 verses 2 through 4. no lesson about christmas or christ's mess is complete without some explanation of the christmas tree remember nimrod little bruce who listened to yah at first but then he changed and wanted to fight against yah well an old babylonian story told of an evergreen tree which sprang out of a dead tree stump the old stump represented the dead nimrod and we already know what y'all says about worshiping the dead the new evergreen tree represented that nimrod had come to life again in tammuz and we already know that y'all says that once you're dead physically you can't come back to life tammuz was nimrod's son so among the druids the oak tree was sacred that means that they celebrated it i mean they worshipped it among the egyptians it was the palm tree that they worshipped and in rome it was the fir tree that they worshipped which was decorated with red berries during the saturnalia and remember the saturnalia was the party the pagans had to celebrate the changes in the s-u-n sun so satan has convinced people that they are worshiping the s-o-n sun but really they are worshiping the s-u-n sun yeah you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 2 see how y'all tells us not to worship christmas trees liberals now let's take a look at santa claus isn't it weird that santa is satan if you just switch the t-a-n around that's not by mistake little hebrews christmas is centered around you children kids people say that they do it so that you can be happy and it all began with the santa claus lie according to langer's encyclopedia of world history under article santa santa was a common name for nimrod remember nimrod throughout asia minor this was also the name of the same fire god who came down the chimneys of the ancient pagans washington irving in 1809 changed the fire god into a supposedly good guy named saint nicholas who was supposed to be this jolly happy and fun version of the fire god 
But what Ivan didn't tell us was that Old Nick has long been recognized as a term for the devil. And I don't know about you, little Hebrews, but the devil is not a nice and jolly and fun person at all. I mean, I don't look at the devil and, and, and be happy. The devil doesn't make me happy. Do he make you happy? In fact, in Revelations, Yahoshua tells us not to follow the Nicolaitans. Because a Nicolite is a person, a follower of the conqueror and destroyer Nimrod. The same bad man that wanted to fight against Yah. Yet this you have, that you hate the works of the Nicolites, which I also hate. So you also have those who adhere to the teaching of the Nicolites, which teaching I hate. Revelations chapter 2, verse 6 and verse 15. See, Yahushua hates Santa or Satan Claus. He hates jolly old Saint Nick or Nicolites, and he hates his teachings. Christ's mess is one of those teachings, Lubrus, and the story of Santa Satan Claus bringing you gifts and eating cookies and drinking your milk is one big fat lie. Number nine, don't be the kind who goes around telling lies. In closing, when the pagans had the party for the sun with gifts and presents and food, Yah did not like it. So he told us not to do it. But we disobeyed him and every year had the same party called by a different name called Christmas. When parents give gifts to their kids, they are worshipping their children. And when the children receive the gifts from under the tree, they are worshipping Nimrod. And so the parents are giving their children to Nimrod, the bad man that wanted to fight against Yah. Yah does not like this, Bruce. He does not want us receiving gifts from Nimrod, and he don't want us worshiping the S-U-N son or mommy and daddy worshiping us either. So don't celebrate Christmas, because it's not something that Yah wants us to do. And remember the first commandment, little bruise. Worship no one but Yah through the Messiah, Yahushua. And that's all, little bruise, big bruise, and all kinds of bruise. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Reg. Big sales and a stampede. Shoppers pushed and shoved their way through Black Friday today, one of the busiest shopping days of the year, of course. The mad dash into a Walmart, Walmart store knocked shoppers to the ground near Grand Rapids, Michigan at 5 in the morning. Despite several people falling to the ground, shoppers charged ahead, fixated on doorbuster deals. A 13 year old girl helping a pregnant woman get up had to be taken away by ambulance. This story now from uh, the opposite side of the country on Long Island, New York. That is where a Walmart worker has has died after the doors opened for early morning sales about 5 a.m. local time. The victim has just been identified as a 34-year-old man, Dimitai Damore. He is from Jamaica, Queens. And WNBC's Greg Sergal filed this report just in the last hour with us. Christmas, what you want? I 
sing. Cause I have all I need. In ancient days, they used to bake cakes to the queen, mother of heaven. They throw a yule dog in the fireplace, but nowadays they leave milk and cookies full of leaven. Whether you're Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, no matter what you are, they got you doing this. Unless you're a pagan, the holiday's not for you. Let it go and let's celebrate the tree. What you want for Christmas? What you want for Christmas? What you want? I say nothing. What you want for Christmas? What you want? I say nothing. Cause I have all I need. What you want for Christmas? What you want for Christmas? What you want? All the families off and home for the holidays. This time of year, won't you let them know what you have learned with cheer? They'll be happy to hear. They can keep their money next year. I've been waiting for you to come because I wanted to ask this question. And thank you, Warren, for calling it in. Please explain who Allah is. Some people say he is the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You've even seen it on some of the Christian television stations that says that. Well, Allah has 99 names in the Quran. And a couple of his names, one of them is the destroyer. And one of them who does damage, does mischief. Uh, ad uh, uh, So uh, these cannot be attributes of God. God is not a destroyer in the, in, the, in the Bible. Allah is a religion that was there, the worship of Allah, was there before Muhammad was even born. Remember, his name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. He is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the servant of Allah. So how could have Muhammad introduced Allah if his father's name is the slave of Allah? You see, it's a Babylonian religion. You have to understand uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, his son Nebuchadnezzar uh, came to Arabia. He came to Yathrib, since you mentioned Yathrib. He came to Yathribu, look at the oracles of Nebuchadnezzar. And he established the worship of Murduk, which did not work. It, it was not palatable to the Arabs. Uh, so then he introduced the worship of the moon god, and that flourished in Arabia. That's why it's called the daughter of Babylon. That's why Arabia is a daughter of Babylon. Uh, so you had the introduction from Babylonian religion. It's a Babylonian religion. And if you look at like, like people in, in, in the Bible uh, regarding the Antichrist, or regarding Gog, let's say. Gog is, a, we always ask, who is Gog? Gog is a reference to a real historical figure. His name was Gaigez, Gugu. He was from Elidia, which is Turkey. He worshipped the god Men, which is the moon god. So the establishment of the moon god was, came from the eons of time. And most Muslims don't know why the moon god is there. It's and the it, crescent moon on all the flags, the minarets, and so forth. It's all over, the symbol of the, of the crescent moon. Yes. Uh, uh, even if you look at the Hebrew word in, 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 Isaiah, in, in Isaiah, where it talks about the five eyes, uh, his name is the word Lucifer. Go to the Hebrew. It's Hilal ben Sahar, Hilal the brightness. Hilal is also an Arab word, which means crescent moon, by the way. Really? So there's a connection there. There's a Babylonian connection of Islam. It's one of the many Babylonian religions. Uh, it, it is totally foreign to the Bible. This is why I was astonished when I started looking at the Bible. I says, there's two different gods. One God hates Jews, one God loves Jews. One God says, hey, we should not unite the world under one language. Uh, Babylon, you know, was, you know, from, mm -hmm. from that moment on, God changed the language. Uh, Islam wants to unite the world under one language, under one religion, one culture, one, one entity. This is not from the Bible. So, uh, let me step in here. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, look, I don't know of a, a translation of the Bible into uh, Arabic that does not have Allah as God. Okay, now how's that going to work? The Quran says Allah is not a father, and He does not have a son. So how are you going to have John 3:16 in this Arabic Bible? For Allah so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The Quran, He can give you the verses, says you believe in the Trinity, you go to hell. 
But the Bible is a triune God. Allah was the chief idol in the Kaaba. There were 300 and some idols. And Muhammad smashed them, but he kept the same, the name of Allah. It's the same God uh, that they had before. Nothing changed. The Hajj, uh, the ha you know, the sacred pilgrimage. It didn't change, did it? They practiced it, the pagan Arabs, for centuries before Muhammad was born. Uh, well, I mean, there's so many details, we don't have time. The, the, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, most important treaty, when Muhammad comes, this is incredible. He's, he's started this Muslim religion, supposedly, and he's living in Medina now. And he comes in 628 AD with his followers. These are new Muslims now. And they come to Mecca. What do they want to go do? They want to join the Hajj. What is the Hajj? They're going to go to this Kaaba. Got 300 and some idols, and Allah is the chief idol, and they want to join the pagans and go around. Okay, that's when Mecca was too strong. They stopped him. And he entered into this treaty of Hudaybiyah, the most important treaty, I guess, in Islamic history because it set the law of war and peace. Uh, it, a, it established a hudna, and these guys are not talking about peace, they're talking about a hudna, a temporary ceasefire so we can gather our strength to destroy you, okay? So, but as part of that deal, Muhammad got to come then the next year, 629. Here he comes. These are Muslims. This is Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. And they join the pagans. They go seven times. Did you ever go on that pilgrimage? No. My father but, did. Yeah. Go seven times around the Kaaba, kiss the dark stone, touch the stone in the Imani corner, run between Marwa and Safi, you know, go to Wadi Mina. Every year they get trampled to death over there mm -hmm. and throw seven rocks each at each of seven effigies of Satan, supposedly. All of the pagan ceremonies that were established before Muhammad was born, the Muslims do them today. Only thing they changed was, instead of Allah being the chief God in the Kaaba, Allah is the only God, and if you don't admit that, we kill you, okay? Mm -hmm. The uh, Ramadan is the same thing. It's the same pagan ceremony. The Quran says, you could probably tell us this verse, that the Quran was first inspired in the month of Ramadan, right? Which says Ramadan already existed. And it was to Maybe be... I could uh, recite the verse. Okay. Inna fi qadr. We have descended the Quran to thee in the night of vision. What do you know what the night of vision is? Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shahr. It is the night of vision that this Quran supposedly came down. That's when the crescent moon shows up. It's better than a thousand months. Tanazzalul malaikatu fiha wa ruhu bi izni rabbihim. It's the day when the angelic host is cast out of heaven by the order of their Lord. Who is their Lord? And when are the angelic host cast out of heaven? This is, this is in the Bible, the, angel, the mm -hmm. demonic force. Mm -hmm. and here's a parallel. The demonic force in the Bible is the good host in the Quran. The Antichrist of the Bible is the Mahdi of Islam. Second John 2.22. Who is the liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ, that God came in the flesh. Mm -hmm. He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Major. So what is Allah? Allah is the religion of Antichrist. It is a form of Antichrist. It is a system of Antichrist. And maybe, I know Dave Hunt will, will agree with me on that one. Talking about Sharia law, you know, everything Dave Hunt would say about what's happening in the world proves my point. Who's changing the laws? Who's asking to change all the laws throughout the Middle East? Who's establishing Sharia law? And what does that law say? Women have no right. Mm -hmm. Does not honor the desire of women and honors a god of forces, a god of fortresses. Who's honoring a god hungry of war and jihad? Who's doing that these days? Is that not a religion of Antichrist? Oh, mm -hmm. my, my, yes it You're is. You're making some good points, brother. <laughs> but, sure are good points. But we still disagree. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so because you're from the old school, you gotta come to the new school. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Shalom, my name is Azariah, YouTube name is Black Nationalist. Some say you're like racist, nation race, same thing. Now, I'm in the heart of counterfeit Christianity, which is St. Peter's Square in the Vatican City. Now, the Vatican City of St. Peter's Basilica was built on an ancient pagan site in Latin called Vaticanus Mons or Vaticanus Codis, which means Mountain of Prophecy. Now, the Vatican Church is the head church of Satan. But when you see what I'm about to show you inside, you'll be under no illusion. 